There we go. Episode 95 uh, of Quark's Insights. I'm back now, but almost. Well, this is my, I've moved, relocated. I have boxes. So it's not my normal place. And I hope my phone will work. So that's good. Um, but anyway, we are here with, uh, I forgot your name now, San and Friends, about uh, performance, uh, which is. One of the things that uh, always keep an eye on when Quarkus. Uh, there's one, there's two things. Every time I explain to people, there's two things we focus on. One is performance. I don't want to, Well, one is developer joy, which is my uh, favorite thing to do. And then there's, there's performance, which is also fun to do, but it always go, goes kind of unnoticed. And then suddenly, either something good, bad happens, or something. Oh, we have a, a giant leap in some uh, improvement for, for some. Yeah, interesting reason. Um, and that's some of the stuff that Sanya and Francis here to talk about. Um, as always, we have the chat. So if you have questions about the stuff that we are talking about here, you just put a question there and uh, I'll, I'll inject it into the conversation. So well, Sanya, you've been here before, so I'll let France introduce yeah. himself. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Okay, so I, I joined recently in the Quarkus team as a, a performance engineer. I'm kind of a hybrid, you know, role because I'm not just a performance engineer, but uh, I'm a developer as well. That's in theory what I pretend to do all, all day long. No, just joking. Effectively, I'm a developer, and uh, uh, my focus is uh, primarily to get in an healthy state the performance of Quarkus, I would say. But definitely not just that one, you know. So I keep an eye on the CI. I definitely provide improvement or speak with the other developers in order to understand if any specific change is going to affect performance or provide micro benchmark or benchmark that help to understand what's going on under the hood or whatever change we would like to provide. Awesome. Okay. And Sandy, who, who are you? Oh, well, I, I work on the Hibernate projects mainly. Um, and um, yeah, I, I've been working on Quarkus since, since we started with Quarkus. And um, yeah, initially, I, my specialization was more in the areas of um, native image, like make Hibernate compile to native and that kind of puzzles. Um, but I'm also very interested in performance and, uh, well, uh, I worked with uh, John initially and now John is getting helped by Franz and yeah, they're amazing. So I have a lot to learn there. Um, but I also have fun myself running the benchmarks at home or, you know, just to verify improvements that we do all around. Very cool. So, well, you want to get started with your, and I think... As an exception, this time we have a lot of slides because performance is hard to show in code. Um, yeah. Well, we don't have many slides, but we have some graphs to show. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll I'll turn on your screen and you can. Yeah. So this is a well-known one, right? Not nothing new here. Like the, the the only thing we wanted to highlight is so this is like a screenshot taken from the Quarkus homepage, and here we are kind of you know bragging how pretty good we are in like memory consumption it's it's way lower than previous stacks and technologies especially if you go to native but you know also on jvm and uh like we we show these two different uh base archetypes like the just rest endpoints or rest plus crud which is including you know a hibernate orm transaction manager connection pools everything you need to actually do transactions on a database so that makes it fairly more complex and um, you know representative maybe of uh, you know you might have two different applications these are two fairly good representations of simple applications that use these technologies right and then yeah. in the second area we focus on um, bootstrap time we focus on uh, first response time which is the metric which we think is the most important to look at um, now these are efficiency metrics or performance metrics but we aren't really saying much on the homepage about how fast Quarkus actually is at runtime. And that's what we want to talk about today. All right. So let's switch to tech empower benchmarks. Um, 
Francesco, do you want to introduce what it is? Yes. Tech Empower Benchmark is a public benchmark made of different stages. Uh, each one of these stages uh, uh, defines specific behavior on, on server side that is allowed in order to have the test to pass. Some of the tests are just plain text uh, raw benchmark. Other involve the single uh, database query other multiple and other just focus on uh, json template uh, um, production so it's not just a pure plain text one quarkus uh, uh, right now is covering with the two three different kind of stacks of imperative uh, full reactive and uh, reactive mixed with the uh, uh, imperative uh, the plain, um, the, the tech and power benchmark, and it's covering almost all the type, but the new introduced one based on cached query that we are going to provide soon. So that that's you know panoramic of uh, the, the tech and power benchmark. They perform rounds every each X month, and uh, we are ready. To, to, to publish somehow the results of the round 2021 20, soon, but not in this Quarkus insight yet. Ah. Where, eh, you know, it's a secret. No, it's not a secret. Well, well there are some clues here, right? But um, yeah. also, like, the tech and power results are focusing on transactions per second. Right? That, that's where the competition is in terms of public benchmark. While on our graphs here, we are looking at a different in a different way. So um, maybe let's explain uh, how to read these graphs. That that's important because it's very different than what Tech Empower does. Like, yeah. do, you, do you want to do that? Yes. Uh, let, let Let's say that in the past, if I remember correctly, in the past Quarkus Insight, there has been some explanation by John uh, O'Hara related to the coordinated omission issue. Yes. And uh, sadly, the, the client, client tool used by Tech and Power, uh, namely uh, WRK, is affected by coordinated omission. The way by which it works is fire as much a request it can. And uh, it's not exactly the kind of test that we would like to use in order to, to compare across different technology or different version for good reason. But I, I want to repeat whatever has already well, explained I, I think, in previous. Uh, well, well, uh, well I, I, say, I think uh, I think it's important to just highlight what it is because it, it comes up oh. again and again every time you have a you have a performance conversation or a blog or something come out of frame something. Um, oh, OK, OK. But, but, but uh, let me try and give my version of it. You can tell me if I'm actually catching it correctly. Um, but basically, this is that when you have a, a, a client-side performance measuring tool that is just kind of firing as much as it can, and then if the other side doesn't respond back, uh, it will just kind of stop submitting uh, things. And then when it summarizes and do the average of it, you end up hiding or at least just not recording the, the period where it was not getting responses. Um, and that's what you mean by the coordinated omission problem, that it's the server side and the client side is think they are doing the right thing, <laughs> but the end result is that you get, you, you're basically missing out uh, what the actual will, the real wait time is. Is that, is okay. that a, or is that a uh, bad version of it? No, it's, it's approximately correct. The, okay. Let's say that uh, the whole definition is coordinated omission. So is it right that performing a coordination because you won't push more load, uh, you know, if the other yeah. side is not, is not capable of sustaining it, it's a kind of coordination. But here there is no omission because if you try hard to put the max schedule possible, it means that from the point of view of the load generator, there is no shadow, okay? And given that there is no shadow, you are not missing anything. So it's very key 
to distinguish between uh, response under load generation and responsiveness under load test, sorry, and uh, all out throughput benchmark. All out throughput benchmark suffer, suffer from coordination, but uh, they're not, they're telling a different story. There, there is no omission. It's fine. It's that form of benchmark. But the other one, the one in which you have a shadow in the kind of load that you, you would like to push, then if you coordinate and you omit samples because of the coordination, that's a problem. Because your system will appear to have much better latency than probably the user is experiencing. And that's the coordinated yeah. omission. Yeah, there are two two additional problems with that. Like, so you are getting the wrong metric out of the system because the average is not computed correctly on on those figures, but you're also putting less load on the system. So if the system would have been struggling because like it doesn't have time to do garbage collector, for example, in this case you're actually giving him um, a pause to recover from anything, and so a system that has problems with hiccups will actually uh, perform better, uh, appear to perform better, oh, which is yes, yeah. not what we want, right? Um, so if you're measuring with a tool which doesn't take coordinated omission into account, it's possible that you're introducing problems in the code and then you verify that you're going in the right direction and the tool is saying, oh yes, you're definitely going in the right direction. But so you get this perverse incentive of making your frameworks and your code worse and worse because it's rewarding uh, for the wrong uh, metric. It's going in the opposite direction of what you actually want when you're having a web server. So so why is it that Tech Empower is still using it? Huh. That's an excellent question. We have had a debate <laughs> there. <laughs> um, one, uh, honestly, one possible justification is that if you all if all what you care about is raw throughput and not about latencies of responses then uh, it is still an interesting metric to have right except that sure. does that's not a good metric for a web server that's what i'm highlighting here right we, if our goal here is to respond to http requests from clients of live traffic on your servers then that's not the primary metric that you should be looking at yeah, I, I completely agree with uh, with Sanne. And probably the only thing that uh, I would say to the tech empower people, if they really would like to stick with the WRK, is that uh, they shouldn't use latency. Uh, they are not using it for score, but they still report it in the, the raw yeah. report. And actually, it's wrong because it doesn't make sense to look at latency at that point. Yeah. You know, it's like driving off uh, of a cliff and asking yourself if your car is very good to steer. You know, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> yeah. Uh. Um, okay. Yes, we need to introduce this slide. <laughs> That's why it's still there. <laughs> uh, thank, thanks, Alexei. Um, good point. We, we're still here. So. Yes. Yes, about so this was a good introduction about you know wrong measurements or good measurements. So how do we want to measure things? Uh, that's what we see on this slide. Like what we want to establish is like what is the expected load of your server and uh, can you respond to your clients in a reasonable time when you have that level of load, right? So on the uh, horizontal axis here, we have uh, requests per second coming in on the server. And on the vertical axis, we have uh, response times. Now, of course, they have uh, a bit of deviation, uh, which I discarded here because I, to plot them on Google Drive, that's what you need to do. <laughs> but essentially what this shows here is like, let's take the yellow line. Uh, it's showing that until approximately 150,000 requests per second, the latency is really low. So we can deliver those responses in a very reasonable time up to at that level of load. Now, when you start increasing this load, the, the latency of the responses is deteriorating very quickly. Notice that this is a logarithmic scale. So the, 
you know, 10 milliseconds might be acceptable for you, 100 milliseconds might still be acceptable for your use case maybe, but in a typical SLA, um, that would be your threshold approximately. Like pe people tend to set something like 200 milliseconds as um, that's their goal for performance of the system. Which means that when we're reaching a thousand milliseconds, we are no longer hitting the goal and the system is no longer suitable for its intended purpose. So if we look here, that means like uh, the yellow configuration is just not suitable above uh, let's say 250,000 requests per second of load, right? So if you have more load than that, you need to scale up your server, scale horizontally, vertically, or upgrade. So that's how you read this graph. Now, what are these lines? Um, the yellow line is uh, Quarkus, but it's version 1.11 beta 1. So it's long two years ago. old approximately. Yeah, it's a very long time ago. And this is in the configuration using uh, a blocking uh, configuration. So Hibernate ORM blocking using GDBC to do, uh, uh, and of course, and this benchmark, as it says on the title, is a single DB load. So it's, it's receiving an HTTP request, and then it needs to do a single query on the database. It loads that results, encodes it as a JSON, and needs to uh, send the response back. And all of the latency is measured from the point of view of the client. So this includes the latency from you know both uh, HTTP round trips and the database round trip and the actual operation on the database, which means we can do pretty you know two hundred fifty thousand transactions per second on this machine uh, on a very acceptable um, latency still. Now at that time we also had a prototype of Hibernate Reactive on the Reactive stack. As you can see already at one hundred and fifty thousand the latency was terrible. That's what you get with prototype software with all the debug code still in there and not polished enough and haven't done any so, performance work so, yet. <laughs> well, did, did, so is, did, did it spike that quickly or is it just where you started measuring? It's where I started measuring. Like this one here on top is my first yeah. point. <laughs> okay, got it. It's my okay. first data point. We could have produced, of course, reasonable latency, but I would have needed to repeat this test with much uh, lower Small. load on the sure. system. Sure. Okay. Now, these two lines are then, uh, you know, the two years old uh, version of Quarkus. Uh, and honestly, it's pretty decent, like, because, you know, the green one, you can ignore. It was experimental. I don't think it was even included in there. Uh, yeah. And yellow one, that's a pretty decent performance. But nowadays, uh, the, the red and blue lines represent uh, Quarkus 291. Uh, I haven't used the latest because this is actually data we produced uh, six weeks ago. And that was the latest at that point. So the performance here is uh, really nice. And it's very competitive with, with other frameworks as well. So basically, 100,000 100, more transactions before we start seeing any uh, anything. And then it, yeah. You get I guess to... it shows. We're improving, which is important. <laughs> yeah. Especially the reactive one is, uh, let's say, production ready now. It's competing with the blocking one. It's in the same ballpark of performance on this particular benchmark. Right. Now, let's switch to the other scenario. Uh, this is uh, multiple queries, not a single query. So here, the benchmark requirements are you get a single HTTP request, and then you need to do 20 sequential queries on the database, then encode the response and send it back to the to the client. Now, 20 different uh, requests sequentially on the database, that means like 20 round trips to the database as well. Um, and here you can see that the reactive stack really starts to outrun the blocking one because it can take advantage of uh, pipelining, which is a feature of the PG client in Vertex, which is you know the, the reactive, the really reactive driver that we are using. And um, so yeah, on this benchmark, um, the blocking stack is a bit overwhelmed by this chattiness with the database, and you can see that the performance is you know it improved compared to the yellow line, which is the two years old, which is nice to see that we improve a little bit, but the reactive one is so much better that you, okay. this is so, uh, 
So just, be, just understand this, this scenario here. This is multiple reads or... Multiple reads, what, yes. Multiple, okay, so a lot of talking to the database, and there the reactor one can... We can't do more. I guess you can have more. Can pipeline. It's like a pipeline, yes. Okay, so each inter transaction is still sequential, but you can have more at the same time. Got it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Now, nice. of course, the client here is hammering our server in parallel with multiple parallel requests, right? But the fact that we're pipelining is just making it the, the whole system more efficient so it can scale better. Yes. Yeah, what, so what, is... what, oh, please, uh, Max. Yeah, it is something that he cannot be seen by these charts, but actually, something that probably we, we can look at it later. Uh, the version using thread pool in order to communicate with the, with the, with the, data, the database is spending a lot of time on content switching in order to have decent concurrency in general. And that's something that the reactive stack complete together with a proper reactive driver completely avoided. And it is a way better usage of resource. Okay, It's not a something that we can see here, if not by numbers, but looking at you know, profiling data, it became more obvious. Okay. And just to be curious, so the yellow and blue is not bad. It's just the red one is way better, right? That's yes. that's it's, <laughs> that's the uh, thing. That's, yeah. <laughs> so it's like because you look the yellow oh, and blue ones get... are still very competitive with existing other you know competing yeah. stacks or even our own stacks. Yeah. Right. Um, and, uh, and that's our... cut, uh, they would all be below that line, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And that's and that's because uh, I remember you and you told me about this some weeks ago. And you said, yeah, we, we, we discovered these numbers. And yeah, it was like, I can't remember the factor you said, but it was like a massive factor. I'm like, wait, 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 what? <laughs> Come again. And uh, yeah, no, that's, that's, that's very interesting. And it, again, I don't know, we had, we had the episode about habit reactive. And uh, I think it bears repeating here again that um, the blocking one is not bad, especially if you have a lot of rights. Like if you have a mix of things, I think, the, reactive, the, the blocking one is probably as, as fine as, as the reactive, maybe. But the reactive, depending on the use case, you can get a massive benefit out of it. But you have to measure it in your use case to know. It's not like you can say it. It's always going to be one or the other. Um, but it is very interesting that the reactive one, in some cases, is like way better than the um, Exactly, but it one. depends a lot on the use case. Like like we've yes. seen on the right. previous slide, there are situations like this one in which you will probably not see much of a difference uh, at all. Yep. Which is also it. good because uh, like we know from design, like Hibernate Reactive is actually depending on Hibernate ORM and sharing like 90% of its code. So you're pretty much, you know, you're running the same thing. Uh, sure. And when, when it cannot take advantage of pipelining, you're getting the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Francesco, you, this is now a good time so to introduce uh, how are we connecting to databases and how are we actually connecting to like how is the HTTP server messages being handled. So for people that don't know, Francesco is also a contributor on the Netty project. He is uh, active in the micro optimizations space with like very low level optimizations on the JVM. <laughs> And uh, so one thing to know here is also like when we are using Hibernate ORM is using the GDBC drivers, which means the traditional off the shelf GDBC stack, which is then using uh, the JDK's, uh, you know, sockets. But when we use uh, the vertex drivers, we are based on Netty. And yep. so the difference here is Hibernate Reactive is actually doing input output over Netty same as our HTTP server, because both of the configurations are running on REST Easy Reactive, which is also based on Netty, and, and they're running on the same vertex event loop. So when we're using Netty in this configuration, we're using ePOL, right? Can you talk about yep. that? Yes, 
Exactly. So we are using the, the default uh, interface for uh, high performance and scalable non blocking system provided uh, by Netty. So basically, EPOL. And EPOL is already a very good API, very stable, very mature, let's say. And it can deliver a very good performance, in particular, the way by which Vertex uh, and uh, for that same reason, let's say Quarkus as well, uh, batch requests uh, both by reading, both by writing. So, and, and that's very key to get the decent performer. Why it's key? Because interacting with the true syscall with the kernel is a costly thing, right? That's kind of right. Because uh, years ago, X, uh, uh, Xbo, no, what's the name? Jens uh, Xbo introduced uh, IO Uringa, is one of the engineers of uh, Facebook. Oh, sorry, Meta, let's say, but yes, definitely Facebook. And uh, he has introduced, uh, uh, together with other, obviously, uh, a new way to communicate with the kernel. This new mechanism is called IOU ring, is uh, built from uh, the bad design decision of another traditional synchronous API with the kernel called uh, LibIO. LibIO was a kind of, uh, you know, Frankenstein because uh, it, was, it was enabling to talk with the kernel in a truly asynchronous way, but uh, by providing uh, two separate ring buffer mapped in memory on user space in which the user stack just send submission to the kernel, the kernel pick it, and then when it's completed, it provides the completion to the other side. Uh, one second, because I got a problem in my headphones. Not that I love my, to, to hear myself so much, but... Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Just one thing I'll mention. Now the IO... work. Uh, perfect. Now it is working. Uh, sorry, Max. So uh, Libio was providing this mechanism by using two different ring buffers to communicate to the kernel what you would like to do. But the problem is that uh, it forced user to still use uh, syscall both on submission and or com on completion. Actually, through an hack is possible to retrieve completion of request by stealing them from the kernel and has been used in many database writing on disk, for example, so for their journal implementation and not only with the M for the MQ broker of Red Hat because I was the one sending this, uh, this change. But this API was very bad suited for other reasons, because it cannot be used on event tools, for example, because it doesn't try to decouple these two things and you can't wait. And you, you cannot awake the, com the completion if outside of, of, the, of a thread, if something is not happening. And it wasn't working that great for networking. And that's why IOU ring arrived. So it provides a clean interface that could be used for, let's say, a huge variety of a syscall right now. And uh, two years ago, thanks to a Google Summer of Code, has been introduced as an incubator on Netty. So now it's possible to use it transparently. So it means that for both the developer of Netty, Vertex and Quarkus, it doesn't mean any change in the code. It's just a shift in the cost model because thanks to IOU ring, it's possible to amortize the cost of communicating with the kernel by batching even across different connections. While in the past, the kind of uh, batching provided by Vertex, Vertex while speaking with the kernel was by batching if on the same connection. Could be through pipelining or any other mechanism. While with the Uring, we can batch even across different connections. That, that means that if you have a huge amount of connection, you will benefit of a massive improvement. And, and this is one of so this is one of those funny things, like no, 
like we're not normal. But like a normal Java table is not like, hey, you know, it's all the same on every OS kind of thing. But this is one of those things. Because IO Ewing is only on we have a Linux kernel, right? So Windows and Mac won't see it or other no, both no, maybe Windover. Windover does have a similar API called ah. uh, you know a fantastic name, IO Ewing, the same. Okay. The <laughs> API is very similar, the changes are similar, but the developers say we have we didn't copy it from Linux. Just inspired, okay. uh, you know, inspired. Inspired. <laughs> okay. inspired. Yes. inspired. Good inspiration. I'm very happy about <laughs> it, actually. So. so, so does Nady support both of them on Windows and Linux? No, just no, not yet because it is even on an earlier state, the one sure. on Windows. But yeah, if but... it's going to be to be stable, why not? I mean, yeah. no, no. But my, my point is just that this is one of the things where, uh, like, even like, let's say. 20 years ago, this was a, norm, a common occurrence, but then we had like 20 years of everyone's kind of the same. But now again, there's like, hey, there's a special someone that like said, like this guy from Facebook slash Meta and the Google Summer Code enabled the right thing. And voila, something like Nady can uh, pick it up and adjust. And then boom, we have a massive improvement. Uh, that is, yes. is really, really awesome. So yeah. yeah. We we, we, we basically get the best from uh, our current hardware because, uh, you know, along the year, the CPU speed hasn't changed that much, you know. But the yeah, cost yeah. by interacting with the kernel, yes, because of Spectre, Meltdown, this kind of mitigation mechanism makes the communication with the kernel much more costly each time. So try right. to reduce yeah. that cost. It means that you can spend that same cycle speaking with the hardware that now is very fast and that allows even for not high performance use case to just get better efficiency that means saving money that is yeah. the, the whole thing about quarkus is not just about being fast be efficient as well and that's important okay. as well and yeah. they, they work very good together and just yeah. clear so the, these the 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 io -uring... Uh, no, the benefit we talk about here, you have to enable again because it's not available everywhere. So you have to do something to enable it, right? Can you explain what that is? Or yes, it actually is a one-liner. Let's say on no, it's definitely a one-liner on Vertex. So if you have the yeah. right version of the kernel that is past five dot one or something like that, or probably four dot nine, but with the few full feature set five dot one, then Netty already have whatever it takes by, you know, having the incubator as a dependency on Vertex and by consequence on Quarkus, then it will work. The point is the PR on Vertex is still there. When it's going to be merged, it means that you will get it for free on Quarkus and you can play with it because definitely if you have a very recent kernel, it's worth to try it. Because it is definitely a game changer, but it's a new technology. And that's what we are going to talk about in the next slide with Sam. Cool. So maybe yeah, also, before... Oh, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. sorry. Yeah, in terms of one-line changes, yeah, it, the, the goal is, of course, that you will not need to have any line of change. Like, if your system supports it, that's, that's what we're going yeah, to do. Yeah, we will just work. But, yeah. of course, as long as it's highly experimental, we keep it disabled under a flag. That's... Yeah. <laughs> So, so Paul Carr, what do we see here? Oh, so wait, wait, before you go on the yeah. Paul question here, but uh, when is the next Texan power run happen? Look forward to see Quarkus right up there. Yeah, can we hold that question a second and finish <laughs> this section? It's a complicated <laughs> answer. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll get back to it then. Okay. Yeah. So oh, okay. I, I just wanted to, to, you know, to finish the OIU ring conversation, Francesco, yes. if you can tell us what are we looking at here? Uh, yes. So I, I don't know how many people of, you know, around knows about this kind of a profiling data visualization. It's called flame roughs. This specific uh, uh, visualization are collected by using a, a sync profiler that is a very good profiler that you know, I tell the people, everyone, please use it if you don't know about it. What we are seeing is, uh, let's see how to read it, actually. So these are actually stack traces. So from the bottom 
to the top, you get the ancestor between, you know, the call stacks and the color R in green is Java code. In red are the syscall, actually the, the, the initial part of the syscall in, uh, in C. The orange part are the, the, the kernel and yellow is GC. Or actually, yellow is a C++. And if you can't see it, it's because Quarkus is good in this. So there, there are some related compiler and GC, but are very tiny on, on the right. But that, that's the general uh, legend about, the, the, legend about the, the colors. Rectangles, the, the wider, the more samples are collected there. So it means that it has happened more time that that specific method appear in a stack trace collected by the profiler. So it means consume more cycles, real cycles, so real CPU time. Okay, I hope it's enough. Yeah, and this is an EPOL call, yes? Yes. I can see that here. And that's very important. Here is not the time you know, to, to perform this operation. It's not wall clock profiling. It's cycle profiling. So just interacting with the kernel, assuming that uh, definitely you have to perform a copy between the user space buffers until the kernel one in order to be sent away by the kernel, there is some cost. Okay. If I remember correctly, Spectre mitigation is on because it's a, yes. be a benchmark machine usual. So it means unless you really want to be vulnerable to Spectre meltdown, and there are low latency firm that disable it, for example, but in any other cases, the people tends to put it on. And that's the kind of cost that you get by interacting with the kernel. Okay. Oh. And let's switch to the IO ring configuration. Okay. So this is the same benchmark, another flame graph captured from the same application, but we only switched the, the native library loaded to do the connections. It's all here. Now the good news is we didn't change a line of code of the benchmark, right? Other than changing the configuration. Yeah, and uh, uh, Sane, if you wanted to search for the read keyword, that's it. You will see that on the top of the violet part, that is the uh, highlighted part, there are no syscalls, and that's very important. Yes. So while interacting with Uring and you read out of the network, no syscalls are happening unless you are going idle because. You know, you don't have much load. So under load, no syscalls. So we are amortizing a ton of syscalls because most operations are not doing it. Mm -hmm. so. Now let's switch back to our data. So how is this performing? So just, just, so, just so I get, so basically you are waiting less. That's the we are way more efficient. Like you you yeah. only need to do syscalls when you're like running out of buffer space, like exceptional situations, like setting up the buffer initially and then under like regime load, you are you know there will always be some exceptional case to handle, right? But the amount of uh, syscalls that you really need to do is 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 uh, significantly reduced. Okay. When normally you have uh, at least a couple per request, you know, it's typically zero. Yeah. And then occasionally you have a Cisco. Got it. Now, when we try this under single DB load, which is, you know, the first of those benchmarks. Uh, so now we have a new color, the orange one, main I under IO ring. Initially, it wasn't performing spectacularly better, but you know, for every experimental technology, like I've shown initially with the green one, 
it's not spectacularly worse either, so it looks very promising, because there is a lot of things that we need to learn about this, and uh, we don't really know how to tune this yet, we haven't much experience of what impacts the performance in these cases. And uh, But switching to the second benchmark, we already have a very significant improvement in performance. Wow. Um, and me, to be fair, yes? Uh, just, just because this, this is really the, we, because we said, you mentioned that the I-ring was production, uh, was experimental. So I just want to, so Tobi asked, you mean production ready? So the first number you shown, like the, before this, that was production, right? Like the, the blue and red and yellow are the production. This is Quarkus 291 normal mode. And yes. then what we talk about now is experimental, but very promising, which is the U-ring thing, which is an orange line. That you still consider. Con that's that's the experimental part, not the one we talked about earlier, right? Just to make sure everyone is on the same page here. Yeah, I wouldn't know how to define production ready here. Like we're just yeah. talking about that connection to like how do we actually handle buffer writes and buffer reads uh, yeah. to the network, right? Yeah. Now that library, you know, is in incubator on Netty, uh, and it was written by a Google Summer of Code student, but under the supervision of Francesco. So I think it's pretty good. Oh. But we, yep. you know, the knowledge isn't very extensive, and you know, we we might not be ready to really support this for production use yet. Yeah. And um, Francesco, this is going to be included as a f um, stable feature in Netty Five, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. And uh, currently, there are uh, tons of additional features that we didn't leverage on for uh, for Euring. For example, one is called uh, Fast Pole Multi Shot. That is a very nice name, actually. It's a very catchy. But what he's doing is very interesting. So each time with Paul, because uh, let's remember, a Yoyo Ring is not a different networking stack. It's, no, it's very similar. But the point is that when you communicate with the kernel, is a synchronous. That's what's changed. So similarly to ePoll, you are going to perform two syscall in order to read some data. One is Pauline to tell, yes, I'm interested into whatever happened on the network. And then when this event is completed, you can ask for a read. So it means that even with a yo-yo ring, you need two asynchronous syscall. Fast poll tells, I'm interested into reading, and I already provide you some memory that you can use to read it. So it costs some memory. The usual trade-off uh, no, between memory and CPU. You provide some memory, but it means that you don't need anything but a wait uh, that the read will happen. Okay. So if you have a, a common use case in which connections are not just sitting idle, you will get a huge benefit. You know? And this is the kind of feature that are going to be to be implemented. Uh, I'm promising something by Norman Maurer as well, but I don't know if he's going to be happy about it, but uh, he got some idea on how to make it and we'll definitely, I will definitely help in order to get it done because it is a very nice feature. So and about basically, what, yeah, please uh, tell me. Uh, uh, so basically what you're saying is that this stuff is very, um, it's not a big change. Well, no, no what I'm saying. You're saying is th this is as ready as it can be, basically. It's just that it's not the API might not be stable, um, but the functionality is, is is there. It's been in the kernel for a while. It's just that now we can use it. And yeah. you're even saying, well, and we can even go further, which is the whole like, which is yes. impressive, right? So that's the uh, definitely. So I guess the, totally we, we, what, what our answer should be to him is like, yes, th there is some changes in or oh, possible change in this API, but it is okay to try out and let us know how it is uh, if you want to. Exactly. So, and yeah. in order to, to, to echo what Sanne told about experimental, what means experimental? That, that, that's my just two cents on it. It's not how many time is, has been spent by developers. It's how many time users spend breaking things in order that developer will make it a bit more stable. <laughs> 
So by consequence, developer yep. takes time. So the, the time to design, the time spent to implement is already there. Things are there, bugs exist, and probably having more people that use it will make it easier for these bugs to, to, to be found. In this current form and the way it has been implemented is way less error prone than the previous one, to be honest. And I, I can say that the Facebook people are doing a great job and Red Hat people as well, because we are involved into it. Very nice. Little change here, but so when I ran this first experiment, the performance I had was actually not very good. Like it was somewhere in between here. And then, you know, we were chatting about that. Hey, what do I do possibly wrong? And we were looking at these flame graphs and then Francesco came with the idea, ah, reduce the number of threads. <laughs> and that is also related with this dip here. You see there also, there always is this little dip like the system you remember the lower the better right the lower latency so here in this area the red one is performing better at slightly above 40,000 requests per second than what it's actually performing at exactly 40,000 requests per second the okay. dip is real and it's consistent like i initially i've been running this test for a couple of years now occasionally initially i thought you know noise I'm doing at home measurements, my tool isn't reliable or something. But it turns out there actually is a very good reason that when you have thrown too many threads at the problem, um, your performance is worse. Can, can you explain that to, to all of us, Francesco? Yes. So <laughs> actually, I can see two different related reasons. One is definitely this one. So if you have more threads for the kind of architecture we got on Quarkus with the, the full reactive stack. It means that the most of the time spent by thread is doing actual work. So they are not blocked, never, unless there isn't anything to do. So it means well, not, that- uh, Not yeah. blocked, but waiting, you mean? Waiting. Yes. <laughs> Better, yes, definitely. <laughs> so they, they are waiting for something in general, but in the current form, they do not block if they have something to do, unless they have to communicate with the curve, actually. In that case, there are all the, uh, you know, well-known computer science uh, thing related uh, how the kernel decide to spread the interrupt in the, the different thread of the application, or if there are any specific policy to, to deal with soft and hard interrupt in the, in the thread of the application. But beside that, the other, reason that is not you know uh, so well known and there is a golden ratio in uh, in the benchmark the golden rate not ratio actually because every hardware can perform very well if they don't won't go to sleep because if for some reason you have a moderate enough load that cause the the, the thread to do some work and then go to sleep and then something happened like network interrupt and then a read and whatever can happen later, then the cost to put in awake and be awakened again, it's so much higher because of the, you know, the communication with the kernel, because how the kernel works on it, that probably if you keep it a bit more busy, things will get slightly better. The point is that when you are too busy, then you start to accumulate a request. And then you have the hockey stick of the latency because it means that someone is with you. And you have a kind of, of a, a head of line you know, behavior because requests still are the queue in, in, a, in, a, in a FIFA way. So it's very important that when you have that flash on, it's probably that you have kept your system busy enough that the latency will improve. But pass to it because the rate is too high, you start to accumulate a request. And then you can just grow in the latency. Yeah. So the performance results here improved massively when I changed the default of Quarkus, which is to use a number of uh, threads to, for the IO uh, event loop, which is like double of the actual cores. Right? Now, since this is a truly non-blocking application, this doubling 
is actually non not efficient because then the mm. all of these threads get awoken and you know it's just a random one that will get the job and the others one the other ones needs to get back to sleep because they actually don't have anything useful to do so to get this improved performance i had to change uh, the property from the defaults we have in quarkus and uh, so we are preparing a proposal for the the whole quarkus team to uh, change the defaults we discussed that with the Vertex team, like why, so the Quarkus default comes from experience with Vertex in the past, right? In which they had done their, their performance things and they had noticed empirically that it was a good default to have twice the number of IO threads compared to uh, actual cores. Except that, you know, then people have been carrying on this rule as a cargo cult and not really verified on newer stocks and uh, what we believe now is that there might have been other reasons, but they are no longer true. So what we're going to have now is we're going to have better performance by reducing the number of threads. And uh, by doing that, we're also having, well, technically half the number of threads. So we're also going to save memory because, you know, each thread is taking own memory. Yes, yeah, so, so the goal, you should understand is that it's about, making sure you don't have idle threads, basically. Like every idle thread is an unnecessary cost. Is that the... It's, it's a larger cost than expected, yes. It's not, just yeah. ha it's not just the cost of having a thread idle, so it's just some memory. It's also having an impact on the efficiency of all the active threads. Exactly. Because they are not active 100%, you know, these things will get load, yeah. load bounced a little bit and, get, you know, and you get artificial latency. Uh, there yeah yeah and, and consider that there are another hidden good thing coming from reducing this number of threads as sanda mentioned there is a reduction of memory but not just uh, it, it's something that we will speak probably by the end of the presentation but uh, mm -hmm. uh, one of the metrics that is not often exposed is how much uh, memory is allocated by netty to communicate with the, the kernel you know and perform operation on JSON or XML encoding, decoding, whatever. Okay, that kind of things are using a thread local arenas. So if you reduce dramatically the number of threads, then you are going to not have any more this thread local arena. So you are going to use better whatever you already have in the other threads. So even a title, the footprint of the overall application will cost let's say half is not actually half because it depends whatever other things is doing the application obviously but let's say the infrastructure itself is going to be much cheaper in terms of memory yeah and this is an optimization that's valid even if you're not using io ring like with this mm -hmm. we have noticed that this is effective even for uh, just uh, you know existing code so we just need to change the default um okay shall we address the tech and power question that's a tough one <laughs> <laughs> so i believe uh the tech and power run 21 already technically happened it wasn't published though on the home page i'm not sure why so either it's just a matter of them finishing to publish things or somebody's challenging something and they want to repeat it. Exactly. You know, yeah. You exactly. know some more? Yes, there is a framework called FAF that was getting about, let's say, 10% more than what the hardware was capable for plain text. And it start, they start, obviously, people rightly start to complain what has happened, how is possible. So now they are investigating on WRK, the way by which WRK measure things, because probably is not measuring things the way the people was supposed to do. A, a very good reason to not use it, but let's say, I mean, that's just one of the additional reason to not use it, but that's what was the reason why it's not published. And um, so the two, the two 
test results I've shown today here are the ones that do database queries because that's the one. So I produced these graphs myself and I am more interested personally in the database access. But Francesco rightfully said, you know, when we started optimizing for tech and power and verifying what we're doing, he wanted to start from uh, plain text. Uh, so HTTP requests. He found initially some, immediately he found some low hanging fruits. But then we hit uh, a very big problem, which implies that our results on Tech Empower 21 are still, you know, even if they are using a client that we don't really like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we would we would still like to have reasonable results there, right? And we are having reasonable results there. But um, tell tell us about this, Francesco. We we, we know yes. they are not going to be as good as we wanted, right? No, exactly. The the thing is that by looking at what the hardware was capable of, uh, and uh, given that we, we have a very clear idea what Vertex uh, is capable of, we know that the reactive version of the stack of Hibernate for plain text uh, shouldn't be distant, actually. But it is. And we discover through looking at the flame graph and uh, studying uh, whatever happened on compilation events uh, that the just in time given the way by which the tech and power benchmarks are run, are accumulating on the just-in-time uh, virtual machine so many profiling data that are misleading for the just-in-time to perform correct decision about inlining, or let's say the best possible decision about inlining, in a way that uh, there are few methods that doesn't compile as good as they could be. I'm seeing this for two reasons. First, Tech and Power is a running benchmark, one uh, the different type of benchmark, one after the other, while keeping the, the Java virtual machine open. And that means that you can have the optimization of the weird behavior that you can get from the just-in-time. And the plain text was the last one. So is the very latest one that is running a, a version of, of, um, of the code that was probably tough for all the previous stages. For this reason, uh, maybe post this. Oh, uh, I don't know what I can share at this point because it is, uh, I mean, right now it requires a lot of investigation actually so we we don't have many charts to show about it what i can tell you is that the effect of this issue we got on the jvm can affect to have even twice the difference on performance or tank on tech and power is very important okay so 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 my my understanding is specific test case that tech and power has so it's not a general issue we hit no. a, a bug in the just in time compiler the base says, oh, this ah. this tight loop is not is not gonna be compiled. Is that, and then I, I we don't know if uh, lose the performance. That, 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 that's a good question, actually. I won't say that it's a bug. I mean, from my point of view, yes. But looking at how the just in time work, I'm not quite sure because uh, the just in time itself perform many decisions. No, and uh, the way by which it yep. performs decision, it plays uh, the so-called uncommon trap in order to capture if there are any changes in the runtime behavior of the application and perform new de-optimization. But if you get a benchmark that run for a few seconds, then change load, few seconds, then change load, then few seconds, it's very unfriendly on how the just-in-time work if compared to native compiled stuff, for example, probably yeah. by running much more the benchmark, new, a, a new compilation is going to happen and things will go right. Fine. So <laughs> that, yeah. that's the thing. So, so, so we try so, to advertise so, people about it. Yeah. So this is one of the cases. So basically what you're saying is that because the way the load happens, the Git doesn't see this as something that is worth spending time optimizing. But a native compiler would have optimized it, and therefore, in this case, native compiler would actually perform better. Exactly. But but in the other case, you could have one where 
if you ran in a certain case, the JIT could be better. Like this is the so what 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 I'm trying to get to is that all these numbers and performance, you know, always take with a grain of salt. What we can see is Quarkus has improved greatly in the last two years, like across the board, but it will depend on your specific use case and your specific setup, what you will see. Right. And that's yes. the, right. so what, what we, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Even better, there, there is a nice quote coming from a very different field uh, from J Jackie Stewart. Jackie Stewart was a, a Formula One driver, and uh, he was one of the people that spoken about mechanical sympathy. And uh, let me read the quote because I don't have great memory. So you don't have to be an engineer to be a racing driver, but you do have to have a mechanical sympathy. So we have to remember that whatever we built, uh, is something on top of two machine, actually maybe more, let's say, but two machine. One is just in time, if it's running on a just in time. The other one is the operating system and definitely the hardware. So it's yeah. very important to understand that there are limitations that are outside what the application can do. It's very important to yeah. know what happened under the hood in order to understand if something bad or good is going to happen. It could is not necessarily something that depends by the application. Maybe, yes. maybe not. So yeah. that, that's the, the level of knowledge that I would like the people to, to be aware of. And the native compilation indeed is very interesting in this use case, because uh, coming from other fields like trading system, for example, they if they are going to use just in time, uh, kind of te technology, they tend to feed their system with the fake data in order to get the right compilation without the optimization on steady state. It's very typical yeah. of that kind of system. Yeah. But if you think about the native one, it's perfect because the native one doesn't know anything about speculating what kind of use cases could be. So it means that if you you don't need to feed things in the right way, it will handle and equally well, whatever cases you got. Maybe not that peak performance if compared to the other one, but if you care about stability of latency, maybe it makes sense to think about it. It's just a speculation. Yeah, you mean, so you, let's try it all, yeah, you, you know. Yeah, you, native image, right? Not native, right? The, you native, the, native image, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Native image, yes. Right. So, um, so yeah, back to our I, results. Um, yeah. There is another thing to keep in mind, like we, what Tekken Power shows is actually like the weighted average of multiple uh, framework configurations. So we had multiple ones based on Quarkus. Uh, we deleted some, we plan to delete some others. Now the thing is we only upgraded and fix uh, the, the, the performance bugs we knew of the ones that we know we want to keep in the long term. So there are still a couple configurations in there which are, have actually been neglected, but they're still affecting the average. So when looking at the results, it's also useful to drill down into a specific configuration to see which configuration you actually want to see the results and not the average among all of them, because there is exactly. some, some noise there. Right? Or the combined. So do not compare with the combined results of uh, the round 21, because he's considering these other, you know, type of uh, type of way to, to so, configure yes. the and uh, finally, yes, since we know about this uh, just-in-time compilation mystery that initially seemed was also, it was only happening on Docker, like I couldn't reproduce it on my machine, we had some issues with that too. Um, but yeah, we are keeping to look into that because we want to know what's going on, of course. But in terms of priorities, it also meant that, you know, we, we don't trust just the Empower for our guidance of... Uh, how to get Quarkus into the right direction, especially because like we, we test it with different clients and, and methodologies. But so we're also testing um, with workarounds, like well, what we figured, what uh, actually Francesco noticed is we used also uh, an AI based tool from Red Hat called um, Cruids Autotune. Cruids Autotune, you know, the team of Autotune, they are developing it. They 
as an experiment, they have run it on our benchmark to see if they could find some uh, suggestions. Uh, we did not really expect that, at least I didn't. Maybe Francesco from the performance team was more in touch with them. But so Altitune came with a set of of uh, JVM flags. Says, hey, try this once. And he nailed it. Like he was able to figure out or help us with diagnosing this system because it disabled uh, the C2 compiler. And we were like, what? Why would you disable the C2 compiler? Um, and well, yeah, Altitude figured that by doing that, you would get better performance. Uh, but of course, it doesn't explain you why. That's uh, <laughs> that requires a different level of yeah. AI. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. it was d d definitely you know a a wow moment uh, for us. <laughs> definitely, oh, whoa, it works. I mean, it, it, but it kind of makes sense in some regard. But you know, I'm still surprised about hearing uh, what <laughs> Simon said actually. <laughs> Yeah, so to get better results in Tekken Power, we'll need to have an additional round, like we need more time. We need to figure out what's going on in uh, JIT and uh, you know maybe we switch to native as a workaround. Uh, we need to remove those configurations that we are not maintaining anymore. And um, hopefully we also need to have a conversation with the Tekken Power team about how some stuff is being measured because we don't think that's the right way. Um, yeah. But... We spent a lot of time about tech power. There is one last slide that has some interesting okay. talking points. Oops. Oh, um, you turned off. Sorry, I meant to turn it on. But so other things that we are working on. Uh, well, Hibernate or M6 is high on the list uh, because I'm doing that myself. <laughs> <laughs> We we know that's going to have an impact on performance for sure because it took us a very long time on the Hibernate team to actually make Hibernate 6 uh, work as a good replacement for 5 and um, it's been many years of work. It's uh, really going to help create uh, better quality SQL statements but also like shorter SQL statements, uh, more optimal SQL statements and also it's going to load um, uh, the interaction with the GDBC driver is positional based rather than uh, name based. And you know, you might think that's a little thing, but in the kind of benchmarks we're driving, those things matter quite a bit. Also, the SQL statement quality itself, you know, just the size of the payload of what Hibernate used to generate with all these aliases, uh, that comes to a certain size of buffer, and we just can't beat the competitors with without making those statements a bit shorter. <laughs> Yes, basically, basically, you're saying that the actual, the actual statement and the code were the same. It's just that the string was longer, right? Yes. So, so and yeah. since we are being measured on how many of these strings you can push on the network per second, yeah, you, you, that's the <laughs> it gives a, a strong advantage if your string is uh, half the size. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Then, then your your ring actually so. We already spoken about it. Yeah. And this vertex connection pool, uh, this is uh, your baby now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, J Julie and Beata from Vertex wouldn't yes, be happy. Right. We, 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 <laughs> let, let's say he got two fathers. So uh, I didn't work actually on the algorithm of the connection pool, but the connection pool leverage on a very nice primitive, a concurrency primitive, is based on uh, and, um, the na name of the concurrent pattern is uh, flat combining. So you can search around on paper or computer science and that's the kind of pattern modified that uh, helps for non-blocking reactive application to act on a, on a shared resource as a single threaded but without having any of the event loop threads to block while doing it. So that, that's the key thing. And uh, we are working in order to improve it and make it uh, more fair in the in the execution of it. And uh, uh, let's switch to new look at the context propagation. Sanne, can you tell anything about it? Oh, context propagation. <laughs> so it's a spec and there is an implementation in small array. So it's a micro profile context propagation. Um, I wrote it, I've written it here in a lower case because we might also just want to talk about context propagation as in the general sense. 
Um, so we noticed the current small RI project is adding a very high amount of overhead uh, in uh, object allocations when you're using a reactive stack, and then that's uh, really dragging down your performance. Um, so we need to either look at the small RI context propagation project to see if this can be fixed. Well, I already had a brief look and I talked with like Stefano, who is also involved with the project. It doesn't seem easy to fix. So maybe we need to discuss about do we actually need a context propagation solution or do we want to do it in a complete different way? Um, the point to know now is if you are interested in performance, be careful of context propagation being automatically activated on all your um, uh, reactive endpoints. Uh, it's, it can be very useful, so if you're using it, by all means, keep using it. But if you have performance issues, the first thing I would do is look if you can disable that. There are multiple ways to disable it. They're all documented, uh, so it should be easy. Um, um, and basically, this is yeah. this is this is just this is similar to the whole thread thing, right? That that the contact switching it becomes more expensive, right? That that's the the similar. Yes, but this is a non. It's not a real contact switching. Like we are still on the same physical thread, but we're switching to different reactive. Uh, yeah, but it's, you know, it's, it's, yeah. <laughs> non non OS contact switching. Let's say. Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. That kind of, yeah. And in relation of the metrics in telemetry, uh, we have uh, new people in, in the team that are in existing people that are already working great on it. And we are going to improve it more and more because it's definitely related to performance. So the more we can observe the system, the more we know about it, the better insights we get on how it performs. And that includes the, the Vertex connection pool, in which we would like to add some new metrics on how it works. And not only, there are a few other places where we're probably going to add the new metrics. But it's a, it's a work in progress, really, because we, even without adding new feature, we discover from time by, by time which part require more observability metrics exposed no and then we will keep it better then the other is improve memory affinity and leverage uh, numa awareness uh, do i have to explain numa numa quickly yes okay so numa is non uniform memory access so many um, server box not server as Sun knows very well because uh, Thread Reaper is not the server from AMD, but uh, allows to have a NUMA kind of uh, topology. But the NUMA kind of topology means that, uh, generally speaking, you you think that the memory is something that uh, through the caches of the core uh, or the core are attached to the same memory. But NUMA allows to have uh, uh, local uh, slice of memory to a specific core because it's exactly how the hardware is. And thanks to this locality, you can get a lower cost by accessing your own memory if you don't have that data in the cache. That's the general explanation. And if it's used well, so it means that you you know which memory you can use locally, then in case you have too much data that is, and you will get some cache misses, then you pay less by accessing those data. Instead, if you don't know about it, and maybe a specific core required to access a kind of a data that is not in its local memory, then you pay a very huge cost. This use cost, cost depends by the hardware. So for Intel, there is a thing called a QPI that connects uh, across uh, the, 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 the core and uh, the, the remote memory. And uh, in case of IMD, is probably interconnect, uh, no, hyperconnect, probably. But that's, you get less bandwidth. So being local, be, be friendly in the access of memory is definitely a good thing 
given that, as we say, that the CPU is not going to be faster anymore. So the access to the memory is king from the point of view of getting better performance. And I can add a couple, a bit of color to that. Like, so we were trying to figure out what was wrong with one of my home machines, like my main workstation, which is a Threadripper machine from AMD. I was occasionally getting about on this benchmark, which was just um, Hello World uh, plain endpoint. I was doing 800,000 requests per second. And occasionally I would get like three, four million requests per second. And that was happening because of the threads that I had pinned through the benchmark where they're the actually running on the right core for this memory access. When we figured the problem out and we could kind of work around my machine because it's a bit of an odd one, we got to 6 million requests per second. So the difference of being correct in terms of uh, uh, yeah, mechanical sympathy in, term, in co correctness in terms of uh, NUMA configuration was giving me from 800,000 requests per second to 6 million requests per second on the same hardware. That, I was, that was amazing, I think. <laughs> Except yes. I don't have a full work, a complete solution for my own workstation because apparently I have a bug in the BIOS and I need help from the main board <laughs> manufacturer. <laughs> yeah, and and we can say that uh, as we say that we have Quarkus, whatever we use under it, so it could be Vertex and then later Netty. The just in time, the just in time already can be sympathetic in related to NUMA. So there are flags that tell the JVM to be NUMA friendly, NUMA aware, use NUMA actually is the name of the JVM argument. And then definitely you get the operating system as well. So you can even tell the operating system to pin your old JVM or Docker machine or Kubernetes pods to a specific uh, node in which every access must be fulfilled by local memory and you will get better performance depend so always depends for for but, performance but francesco this will require some work on on the netty and vertex side too right yes so, because of things for the application side whatever we we do on the application side related the java ip is already managed by java itself to be new malware. But given that uh, we have even the allocation inside of a Netty, and Netty uses its own algorithm of all allocation, right now these algorithms are not new malware. So it's, and if we leverage a lot on them, obviously it means that we pay some additional cost, we can save it. So that's the kind of improvement uh, we would like to push on Netty. Uh, cool. We're nearing the end of our topics here, but yeah, um, while doing this performance work, of course, we occasionally spot <coughs> issues in integration. So uh, particularly happy with the Arc team, like they are super responsive and helpful for every time I find a small allocation issue that I want to get rid of. We make some small changes in there, but it's the same for all the other Quarkus core libraries. Like when we see something, we tend to go and want to fix those. Um, and yeah, the Quarkus extensions, uh, a little thought about that. So I have been working a fair bit on the Hibernate ORM extension because I also wanted to set an, like an example for other extension writers of all the crazy things you could do. Now, of course, most people, when they write an extension, they focus on uh, make it work. Right? Uh, but please remember, the architecture that we offer can give you a lot of opportunities to not only make it work, but also make it work really well and at very minimum footprint, um, both on JVM and in native, when you take advantage of all the capabilities the Quarkus uh, built items are offering. And of course, we'll also keep working on bootstrap optimizations. You know, if it can boot faster and with less memory, it's always nice. <laughs> Very cool. And the last one, bootstrap optimization, is something that uh, I don't want nor me or Sanne to get all the credit because definitely is something that uh, has been improved recently by uh, Georgios, for example. And uh, I would like to thank the whole Quarkus team because 
working as a performance engineer with them is very challenging. You know, you find something to fix and you tell someone for because you want to chat, you know, Let, let's say, oh, I found some exception exception while Quark was start. Let's remove them. And two minutes later, send PR. Oh, come on. Already. <laughs> that's it's that, like that's that. so. That's, 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 that's gorgeous. That's gorgeous. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, definitely reactive uh, in every stack. I can say so. Nice yeah. one. Yeah. No, but that's that's the that's the, the the key part. Like that, we are focusing on 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 both performance and developer experience. And uh, I think you did a great job explaining how. Like this is the fun part. Like this this performance is not just about making it run faster. <laughs> is to actually observe and see, oh, the hardware architecture changed over the last couple of years. And by tweaking a little bit, we get a better be behavior. And it, oh, by doing async all the way up, we suddenly get a bigger boost than we've seen in every, for years. Uh, and uh, yeah, just getting that out there and, and, and try to install, explain that is, is, is awesome. Um, we got one question, so this was the, uh, you mentioned the AI tooling uh, Cruise, I think it's called. Uh, if it's an internal product or publicly available, it is uh, publicly available. I put the link uh, in the, the chat. It's GitHub Calm Cruise Autotune. Um, I'm not sure if it's in a product yet, um, but it's definitely worth exploring. Right now, mm -hmm. I think it's targeting mainly tuning Kubernetes settings, right? So basically, it it, it's, uh, it's an AI that uh, looks at uh, all the different settings it can know about. And one of those could be the memory flags, other could be like the, um, uh, what's the, like uh, memory settings and stuff for the actual uh, nodes. But also, yeah, the memory flags. And that's where they let it run. Yeah, we're also our... teaching it about uh, Quarkus configuration properties that affect performance. Yeah, JVM, right? of course. So like, Thread pool sizes, uh, yes. on off flags. And then it basically, I, I think it just kind of does uh, mutations of it. And then just try and measure and see how it's like um, what's called generic, um, generic, generic AI or uh, kind of thing. Where it just kind of goes through some phases and then try and find the optimal place. And that's where one of them was oh, if you disable C2, then you get a bit of results. So like, oh, okay. So it's it's um, it's basically just a machine that experiments and then measure, and then oh this these this combination uh, makes a difference, and I I think from the conversation we had today, we realized that there's no single answer right, and that's why these tools can actually discover things that we would just be like wait that's not that doesn't make sense, and then you try and go like oh oh yeah, <laughs> that's the case, yeah. so yeah so it, it is publicly available. Um, you can give it a try and see it works for your uh, use case. Um, did you have more for the, the last slide here? Uh, just a final thought. Like We don't want to focus too much on one particular benchmark. right? So the performance team is working on multiple benchmarks. And uh, we definitely desperately need feedback from production research, pe you know, people that have realistic workloads, real production issues. If you have performance puzzles, uh, come forward. We love them. And uh, that's, for us, that's more important than what we do on Tech Empower, right? Yeah, and, the real, um, get the real numbers. Yeah. Yes, because, of course, you know, we are going to hit the ceiling with this pretty soon. You know, we know these numbers, like, that's what the hardware can do. And we know how to get there. And then we get bored. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, and, let, yeah. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, I, go ahead, friend. I can add that uh, one of the nicer thing of performance puzzle is that uh, often they they highlight not just performance problem but even configuration problem and that's equally important because it's part of the overall developer experience. So if we got a, a misconfiguration that not that to be used to spot, is not user fault. Sometimes. But sometimes not. So it's important yeah. to discover it and then fix it. So it's, yeah. you know, to... right. That might lead to better guides and better uh, suggestions in the reference for configuration files. Yeah, exactly. All these, 
or well, not anecdotes, but these experiences and uh, having something that we can refer to and, and go back and document it is, is super key. Um, I'll, 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 end up, I'll end on my note of saying the one thing I learned in the last month or two was that we were looking at, at tests. There was a performance that was measuring, comparing Quarker to something else. And that something else was winning. And we were like, that didn't match up with our numbers. Yes. Um, and we spent a lot of time like, how the hell? Oh, sorry. How could that be different? Because it just did not make any sense. And uh, there was two things that were discovered in that process. One was that um, uh, trans they were using uh, Hive Interactive uh, async uh, for, uh, database access, which should be, of course, be great. But then they also enabled uh, transactional, which is a, a blocking oh, yeah. annotation. And that caused that uh, you had a failure. Like, Quark, it's not a wrong thing to do, but it means that if you're not doing the right thing, it, it hurts your performance. So you fix that, and suddenly we beat it, like we beat the, the, the other thing significantly. Um, but it was still not like seeing, seeing the numbers that we, we thought. So what we actually figured out was that because the tool, the test was actually very DB heavy, so it's stressing out the database more than the framework. So what we did was, I think, was that for you or was it um, uh, John? I can't remember. What either you or John say? Hey, how about we squeeze the CPU on the on the, the where uh, Quarkus and and the other one yeah, throttle, right? Meaning that the, the same code that was looked to be the same performance wise suddenly got squeezed for resources, which is what would happen in normal load. And suddenly the other framework just collapsed and Quark just survived. Uh, and that was again, just a, a testament of the way that Quark is, is architectured, that it, it's not only fast, but also when resource starts being low, it survives or, uh, well, I don't know if it survives, right, but it performs better. Um, and that was something that makes sense when you hear it, but you don't think about it. So when you make sure when you measure these things, um, check, yeah, the numbers, it looks fine. fine. Uh, a is better than B, but you actually go and look, you say, oh, you actually mess up the thing that had no, there's no pressure, no nothing. And, and therefore you weren't actually missing anything. Uh, so yeah, try and squeeze your CPU parameters and the memories, and then you'll see how it actually true behave. It makes, it makes a, very different picture so so yeah all right guys we've we've talked for a long <laughs> time but this was super interesting i didn't want to stop it off um so uh you know thank you santa and friends and i look forward to the next time when we've updated the tech and power test so we actually look much better um but uh, that is very good and for everyone who's listening there you know try out your you know measure but don't don't trust the numbers look at it uh, see your use case and try and understand why it's behaving as it as, as it is. Uh, you might you might learn something. And if you find something that's like, hey, wait, Quarkus is bad here, let us know, and uh, we, we will we will help out. It's basically uh, and learn from it. So yeah, cool. Anything else, send in friends? No, nope. thank you All so good. much for having us. No problem. This is good. Thanks. Thank you guys. See you around.